It's really my pleasure to introduce Mark Griswold today. He's uh, one of the stars on Case's campus, one of the, the best known MR physicists in the world. He um, uh, got his PhD at the University of Illinois in Chirpan, uh, Urbana-Champaign and then went to Germany and got his PhD at the University of Würzburg, which is why he's aware to, allowed to wear the little glasses. Um, he has two, over 250 published um, papers, including one with nearly 4,000 citations. So I asked him this morning about what that was. It's an algorithm for doing fast MRI scans, and it's on every Siemens MRI scanner in the country. It's used on 100,000 people a day. So it's very impressive. That's real translational research. And it's uh, as if that wasn't enough of a career, I have to give a plug, because he's not going to talk about it today, about the Interactive Commons, which is Mark's like second career. So he has started um, in this little basement space that I think is, is, has plans to grow. The Interactive Commons, it's, it's um, a fantastic space for investigators in the university and, and really not just in the university to interact in new ways with colleagues um, and start new kinds of collaborations. Um, they have a strategic partnership with Microsoft around the, the HoloLens, which is a um, hologram technology that um, I've been using with Mikkel Peterson and Cameron McIntyre to teach, uh, think about new ways to teach uh, DBS to uh, physicians and I got to tell you, it's, it's mind blowing. If you haven't been down to the Interactive Commons, you got to reach out to Mark. Uh, he's the faculty director, and uh, Aaron Henninger is the uh, executive director. You got to reach out to one of those people and get down there and, and check out what's available on campus because it's really spectacular. So, without any further ado, Mark Griswold, thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks, Andy. Um, and thanks for everybody for showing up. Uh, I, I have to be honest, uh, when, when I got the invitation first, I, I thought, well, what, what in the world does this group um, doing electrical stimulation want to do with me? Um, and I thought a little bit more. And, and at the end of the day, um, a lot of what you guys are doing is trying to interact with the nervous system in new ways. And I'm in my first day job spending a lot of time trying to image that same system. And I think that when I look at a lot of the stuff that's happening here, um, you know, a lot of the, the targets that you guys are after are first visualized with imaging. And then um, it's all about then trying to get that in the most accurate and reproducible way so that we can treat the most patients around the world. Um, and so I put together a talk on some of the work that we've been doing towards that direction on magnetic resonance fingerprinting. Uh, and it's a, it's a somewhat complicated topic. Um, and I could probably sit up here and talk to you about it for, for hours and hours. But I'm going to try to um, give you a simple overview of, of, of how it works and, and some of the motivation behind it um, and why it might be important for some of the work that you guys are doing. Um, but before we're going to launch into this very complicated or somewhat complicated MRI topic, I thought um, we should first talk about the weather. Um, so the, the story starts a couple of years ago. I had to make a trip to Brazil in February. And this was the weather on the day that I had to leave. Um, so in Cleveland, it was about the same temperature as it was on the North Pole. And in Rio, it was, um, my memory is 40, 42 degrees Celsius that day, which is, um, you know, super hot. Um, and so when we, when we look at that, we could say that in Cleveland, it was very cold. And in Rio, it was hot. Um, you could even say it was very hot there. Um, and, you know, this is how we would describe the situation this day I had to go. Um, but if you ask somebody else, like this guy, he might say, well, that weather in Cleveland is not so bad. In fact, it may be hot compared to him. It may be warmer than his normal situation. Um, we can also think about the weather in, in a different way and think about climate. So climate is this, this long-term trend of, the, the, say, the temperature or the, you know, the precipitation. And this is something that we know is changing, if you're at all um, in tune with science. Um, we know that the Earth is getting warmer. But we as humans are really bad at sensing that. This is part of the problem why we have such a difficult 
um, time discussing climate change. Because we just live our days day to day to day. But if I were to ask you what the temperature was on this day last year, I don't think that any of us would remember it because it's not something that we sense and, and, and can maintain. It's not a skill set that we have. And so we lose these long-term trends, especially over years. So I remember when I was a kid, it would probably be even colder than it is today, um, but, but I would have to go to a table to look that up. And so I just want to kind of summarize this, that we use words to describe situations. I know this is kind of stupid, but just stick with me for a second. Um, it, the, the, the other thing to note is that different people use different words depending on their experience. Um, and so the crux of this is that those words are not reproducible. Um, if you ask a different person, they're going to give you a different answer. And it depends on their experience. Um, and the other note is that words like this are not sensitive to global change to global changes, or changes that happen over a long period of time. Um, what we do, and I already kind of made an aside to this, when we're talking about the weather, is we use a, a thermometer, we use a barometer to get numbers. And the reason is that the numbers allow you to make good decisions. So for example, this morning, I could have looked out the window, and today was maybe an easy one where I could say I need a coat. But if I were to go back to last Sunday, it was beautiful outside. It was blue skies and clear. So when I was looking out my window, I would not have known whether to wear a coat or not. By you know, the, the table, I would say, you know, December, clear skies, it's very cold. In reality, it was like 55 degrees, right? I didn't even need a coat. So the numbers on the, on the thermostat or on the temperature Allow, on the thermometer, allow us to make good decisions. The subjective feelings about, hey, it looks nice outside, do not allow us to make good decisions. Um, so what does this have to do with MRI? Well, if we look at the way that we typically do MRI, it, it looks like this. Um, and what we uh, essentially have a radiologist do is they look at this image and they say, hey, that spot there in the upper right of that image is too bright. It's hyperintensity on flare. Just means it's too bright. So you can ask some, some simple questions here. Is the brightness in this image related to disease? And the answer is no, because actually the brightest thing in this image is the subcutaneous fat, so, which we know is totally normal. You can say, does the brightness lead to, you know, correspond to the severity of the disease? Obviously not true either. Actually, the dark spot in the center of that lesion down there could be worse than the, the lesion up there. Um, and so are the numbers in this image, the brightness, are they reproducible from day to day to day, from scanner to scanner to scanner? And the answer there is also no. Right? So we, we are living in this world of MRI. And, we, and I, I've done MR for, for half my life. It's amazingly powerful, and I love doing it. But we've completely adopted this language that is not reproducible. And this has been a fundamental problem for us. And to me, it's, I, I can't think of another area of medicine where we get away with this. Right? So this is like the analogy that I use. Could you imagine doing this? <laughs> like coming in and saying, you know, you're just too fat. Am I one pound too fat? Or am I 100 pounds too fat? Am I, you know, what, what, what do I do? Because I can't make a decision based on that. Right? In every other area of science, there's a number. Whether I'm measuring glucose, your weight, your blood pressure, and all of those numbers lead us to a diagnosis, right? If, if your um, glucose is 208, you've got diabetes, period. There's no question. It's that one number tells me this whole series of, of things about your physiology. So how is it that we're spending thousands of dollars an hour in an MRI and not providing that same kind of result? All right, so numbers coming out of an MRI would allow us to make better decisions, but because of the physics, the way that MRI happens, this actually is really hard. Um, so I'm gonna just spend a, a couple of seconds diverting to that, that difficult path. So those of you who have done MRI know that you probably have heard these terms of T1 and T2. And essentially these are um, time, or time, um, time parameters for 
the relaxation of our magnetization. So T1 basically gives us the time that it takes for the magnetization to recover after an excitation, and T2 is how quickly it decays away. Um, the cool thing is that both of these relate to physiological things about the tissue, which is why it's so, so powerful. But both of these are exponential functions. And so T, the T1 and the T2 sit up in these, these, these exponents. So what that means is if we want to try to actually get the number of T1 or get the number of T2, you have to take a whole bunch of images um, sequentially with different, let's say, weightings to T1 or different weightings to T2. And then we can use some math to solve for the T1 and T2. But what this means is that we have to take, let's say, 5 to 10 images for T1 and 5 to 10 images for T2. And that's 5 to 10 times longer um, scan time. And so for each one of these, this is, you know, right, right now what we do is we essentially just live with one of these. And that's already at the limit of what a patient can tolerate. And so the thought of um, potentially putting them in there for five or ten times as long is just clinically unrealistic. It would take our 15-minute slots and turn them into multiple hour slots. In fact, a lot of that was what people were trying to do back in the 80s, which is why it was, you know, common for somebody to sit in a magnet for two hours. Um, but, but for us, that's just not feasible today. And so what we do is we live with just one of these weighted scans. So that's a T1 weighted scan or a T2 weighted scan. And they tell us uh, something about the, the T1 or the T2, but they're not quantitative at all. And this has real world implications. So this is an oncology example. This is a real case that came in. And so a radiologist looks at this and says, I actually don't really know what this is. This could be a MET, so a tumor that comes in from somewhere else in your body that's growing in the brain, or it could be any one of a number of primary tumors that started in the brain. And obviously there's a very different treatment course um, depending on what that answer is. And so what do you do in this case is you go and you take this patient and you send them to a biopsy. Well, so a brain biopsy is not simple, right? This is something that's going to happen in an OR. You're going to need an, an uh, anesthesiologist, a neurosurgeon. They're going to drill a hole in your head, put a needle in, take some tissue out, and then figure out what this is. Because you have a hole in your head, you're spending at least a day in the ICO and most likely more. And so the total cost of this little adventure in the U.S. in 2013 was between twelve dollars and $51,000. And this is just to figure out what's going on. We haven't even done any treatment, right? This is, this is just one step on the path of making this, this patient better. So if you think an MRI is expensive, to me this is super expensive, right? And, and it has a huge amount of risk to it. So we, you know, we said early on, um, starting back in around 2003, this has got to change. And my colleague, well, let me just, just run through this. So this is back when I was in Würzburg, Germany. Um, some of you will recognize some of these people. So this project started with Vikas Gulani, who was there as a postdoc at the time, and Nicole Cyberlich, who's there, who's the EME faculty, and Peter Schmidt, who's now at, at Siemens. Um, and um, Vikas coined this term, this phrase, and it's stuck with us um, ever since, and it drives a lot of what we do. Every biopsy is a failed imaging experiment. Right? So we, the, the fact that we're still putting needles into somebody to figure out what's going on, and you really think about it, it's crazy. When we have an MRI, we have CT scanners, we have ultrasound, we have photoacoustics, we've got all these things. That should be what tells us what's, go what's going on. And from that point, if we're doing our job right, we should be treating the patient and making them better. We shouldn't have to go to somebody to stick a needle in something just to, just to understand. Um, so this sounds really easy, um, but um, I can tell you this was a super hard problem to tackle. Um, so starting in 2003, I can show you a whole series of papers that we did um, where we were trying to figure out this problem, and we just kept getting further and further away from an answer. Um, and I'm telling you this for mostly for the students to, to, to sit, that there's some times in your, in your career where it's good to just take a really big step back and say, what in the world am I doing? Um, 
and this is this is a decade of us not doing that where we should have done it a lot sooner. Um, but we finally did when we when we got here. Um, so starting probably in about 2011 or, or 2012. So again, after about a decade of of bashing your head up against the wall, we started asking ourselves, why in the world are we doing this? Um, and we started just talking about the the shapes of these signals that we were trying to map. So again, if we're looking at, at pretty much any MRI experiment, you're trying to, to figure out the shape of one of three types of curves. There's either a decay, there's a recovery, or you're trying to just figure out a level. So trying to make this assumption that everything is flat. Um, so if we just look at it like a recovery curve, what we were trying to do was map this, as I said. So, um, and as Andy said, we had, we had come up with these set of methods to, to go really fast where we were going two or four or eight times faster. And so we said, you know, if this is the, the kind of conventional thing, what we'll do is we'll just go a lot faster. And the problem was that in doing that, we had introduced new errors or new deviations from what we were doing. Um, and so it didn't really work. So we said, well, let's just go and add a correction to it. Well, now that you're adding a correction, now your time is longer. And so we we'll just said, well, let's just go faster and faster. And so we, this is essentially the series of papers is us just trying to go faster, but then getting further and further away from our goal. So um, we eventually just said, well, wait a minute, why in the world are we trying to map those curves? Why, what in the world is so important about these three curves? And it sounds maybe like a dumb, dumb uh, question, uh, but it led to this great answer for us. The reason that MRI for, you know, since actually going back to 1948 has used these three curves <laughs> is because that's just the way everybody's always done it. And this is the worst answer for you to continue to do something. <laughs> and, and for us, this was a big revelation that, well, wait a minute, we don't, we don't have to map that thing. There's got to be other options. Um, and so we started asking this question, is there a different way? And I'm not kidding, in about two weeks, we had this thing up and running. Just for this simple process of going back and saying, wait a minute, what are we doing? Um, and, and, you know, essentially we, we had to give up 60 years of, of science, but it was absolutely worth it. Um, so to skip through a lot of development, um, and I'm happy to run over the physics with you individually if you want some time. Um, what we came up with was this concept called magnetic resonance fingerprinting, where you, you throw away a lot of those um, those shapes, and you and you throw away a lot of what's been known in MR. And it starts with this fundamental thing that I don't have to know what I'm doing necessarily. So we we start with a, a randomized acquisition where we take essentially every knob that we can in the MRI and we just turn it. So instead of just taking these very regular, um, regularly spaced acquisitions in that T1 or T2 recovery curve like we were talking about, we just sample all around. And the goal of that acquisition isn't to get a very nice looking signal, it's to do something very different. It's to make sure that every tissue has a different signal evolution. And we showed in the paper, and I can run over the physics with you, that, that, that doing these kind of randomized acquisitions is one of the ways to do that. So it will make gray matter and white matter have different evolutions in time. Now, I, as a human, cannot recognize what those evolutions are. But a computer can. And so what we do is we pass those signals that we observe to a pattern recognition algorithm. And the cool thing about this pattern recognition algorithm is that we can calculate all the evolutions from first principles. We can go directly from quantum mechanics to what we would expect. And so this dictionary, in a way, is perfect. So we can do a very nice pattern matching. And then what this means is that we get directly to the quantitative information that we care about, things like T1, T2, or diffusion, and so on. And so this is a way around those problems that I've been talking about up to this point. And we called it fingerprinting because it, it's very much analogous to what's done in conventional fingerprinting that like the FBI or the CIA would do. So they would start with this image in the upper left. And if you look at that, that's in, in some ways just a random series of black and white lines. 
I as a human cannot look at that and really understand or, or make any sense of it. Um, but a computer can based on a database of known fingerprints. So they go through and they match it, and then that becomes the way that they get the information that they care about. Right? They don't actually care about the information about that fingerprint other than the fact that it's associated with this person, this is their phone number, and so on. So we do the same thing in MR fingerprinting. We get this very random looking um, signal here. And in, in that, again, I can't, I can't make sense of it as a human, but I can calculate this database from quantum mechanics, and then I can do a match between that signal and its entry in the dictionary. And then I know what went into the calculation of that dictionary, for example, the T1, the T2, and so on. Um, so when you give up all these other um, concepts, there's, there's really only two things that matter in this whole big scheme. The first one is the, the one that I said on the previous slides, that I have to be able to tell different tissues apart from one another. We call this temporal incoherence, right? So that two tissues are not coherent with each other. And then I also want to make an image at the end of the day. So I want to be able to tell different physical places from one another. And so this is spatial incoherence. I want to know that the signal came from the left side and not the right side and so on. Um, so the way we get this top one is through a randomized or variable acquisition. And the way we get the bottom one is from a randomized encoding scheme. The bottom one has been known in MRI for about 15 years or so. Um, so we were really fortunate enough to get this into this very nice journal. Um, it's been five, over five and a half years ago at this point, which is kind of crazy. Um, but these are the kind of acquisitions that we, that we deal with. And I know a lot of you may not deal with MRI acquisitions that much. But essentially, we, there's our radio wave that comes in, an RF pulse. Um, then there's um, some slice selection where we choose a particular spot in the object to scan. And then we do readouts um, that, where we do this spatial encoding. And the point here uh, for fingerprinting is that there's a timing that's associated with all of those. And we can vary all of those timings very easily. This is something that's, that's, that's completely standard in MRI. And this will run on any MRI scanner that we know. This is not difficult. So then what we do is we pick, we start with a tissue. Let's pick a particular tissue with a particular T1, a particular T2, a resonance frequency, or, or whatever properties we want associated with that tissue. And then we take the, the acquisition sequence from the previous slide, which again is perfectly known. And then we run that through the block equations, which are these quantum mechanical equations that came from 1948, which again are very well known, very well established. And then you put those two together and you get a set of signal evolutions out. And this, these are examples for some different tissues that you might see in the brain. So what you can see, um, depending on you know, we can, we can run all kinds of different sequences. So this is the two sequences that we published in the original paper. There's a sequence A and a sequence B. Um, what you see is that for each of these different tissues, they all look different. So we met our first criteria um, that the different tissues look different and have different signal evolutions. Um, the other thing to note here, um, just for those who do do MR here, um, is that the signal level, the magnetization level, is really high. So in a typical... Um, like MP Rage T1 weighted acquisition that you're used to using, the magnetization, oops, the magnetization is around um, 7% of the equilibrium magnetization. So 0.07 is where it would be, be landing here. And you can see that we're many times higher than that here. Um, the other thing to note is that the signal is not decaying away or reaching a plateau, that it's constantly oscillating around. What this means is that we can scan forever and continue to add new information the whole time. So there's, um, this gives us very high efficiency. Um, we don't have any dead time in our acquisitions. So I'm just going to run through some of these MR specific results, but it doesn't really matter if we put a phantom in, whether you use sequence A or sequence B, and we've got hundreds of sequence variants that we've done now. They still get you the same quantitative results. So even though the, the shape of those two signal evolutions is wildly different, the quantitative results that come out are the same. Um, so just to give you 
uh, one more clue, the way that we do these readouts is typically through some sort of undersampled spiral or other type of acquisition. And we do that in a way where it looks randomized as well. So we get signal evolutions that look like this. This is what one individual time frame looks like. It's very ugly. Um, but from that evolution, we get maps like this. So um, from this one acquisition, which was about 30 seconds at that time, and this is, we're getting quantitative T1, quantitative T2, quantitative off resonance, and a relative spin density, which we've now also made quantitative as well. Um, so four, four quantitative numbers at the end of the day from, from one acquisition. Um, so those were five years old data. Um, these are about a year old. Um, so the resolution is just getting much higher. Um, and we're starting to look at these um, now in, in color um, to try to um, optimally use the way that our, that our eyes work to be able to communicate this. Um, so as much as possible, um, if you see an orange red type map, that's a T1. If you see a bluish yellow map, that's a T2, just so that we can coordinate those. Um, so as I said, there's a lot of different variants. I'm going to talk about one that just um, is, is particularly relevant for this audience. Um, this is an acquisition called a, a quest acquisition where there's a lot of these RF pulses are just missing. You just leave them out. And um, because of the way that MRI works, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, we can get signal back from um, sequences like this even with the gap. Um, and so they, they essentially follow these different coherence pathways is what, just, what, what this is called. And I don't want you to understand this other than the fact that the signal is evolving through these different pathways this whole time. Um, some of it is relaxing according to T1, which is the blue line there, and some of it is T2. And so when you stack together these different evolutions, they, they relax sometimes for T1 and sometimes in T2 and in varying orders. And what you get out are, again, these very complicated signal evolutions. But again, we can perfectly match them to the dictionary. This is perfectly calculatable. Um, and the, you know, so this is different than the other one, but this one has a, has a real particular reason. So by leaving out all of these RF pulses, we're leaving out the thing that heats up um, the patient, and in particular, it heats up implanted devices. So in this example, we're getting quantitative T1, T2, <laughs> And we can, again, get a quantitative spin density out, which then we can go back and we can simulate the clinical exam that you would have gotten. So that's a simulated spin density, a simulated T1 weighted, and a simulated T2 weighted scan. All of this in about a 30 second per slice scan. But the real number is down there in the bottom. So the FDA limit for whole head SAR is around 4 watts per kilogram. This is the limit that um, your cell phones operate under. Um, and this sequence, this acquisition, is at 0.03 watts per kilogram. So about 1% of the FDA limit. And so what this means is that if you've got an implanted um, electrode, an implanted DPS device, anything like that, where the heating risk has gone up, so an MR you can get, say, 50 degrees C from, a, uh, from an implanted DPS lead, we can now reduce that by a factor of 100. And so now you're potentially down in the 0.5 degree zone. So you could take somebody with a DBS and get them a, clinically, a clinical quality exam or pretty close to it without the risk of damaging that, the DBS device or damaging the patient. Um, so we've worked with um, Cameron and Ben Walter on this over the years. And so that Quest acquisition, this is um, thermoptic um, temperature measurements um, taken on a phantom. Um, the, the flash and the TSC are more conventional, low SAR sequences that are run um, clinically today. And the, the, just to be, be clear, the, the FDA limit here is one degrees um, temperature change over one gram of tissue. You can see this TSC sequence violates that at the tip, which is that blue line. The flash is kind of borderline, and the quest is down in that half a degree zone. So we can, again, potentially get clinical quality results out of an exam that's safe to use with these implanted devices. And to me, this is really important because if you've just got, let's say you're a 50-year-old person who's got Parkinson's, early Parkinson's disease, you could go get a DBS um, lead. Your risk for brain tumors or for METs 
or for any other disease is exactly the same as everybody else. But if you've got a DBS implanted in your brain and you come in with a suspected brain tumor, I cannot put you in the MRI today and get a clinical scan. And so this is potentially a pathway that we could use to, to make it safe for these patients, which that could then lead, we think, to, to broader adoption. So this is one of the pathways that we're taking. I'm not going to go through the technicalities of this sequence, but we're also then expanding the number of measurements that we can get. So this one um, is essentially the right scan here. So we're getting um, five, and there's actually one, one more that we could get out of this, um, essentially six different tissue properties from one scan. Um, and in particular, this one adds this T2 star measurement, which is the root of, um, if you've heard of fMRI, that's what's typically used there. Uh, it's used in susceptibility weighted imaging, SWI. Um, there's a lot of other types of ap uh, applications. Um, quantitative susceptibility mapping is another one. And so with this, with this method, we can start looking at these deep brain structures uh, that are a target for DBS stimulation, for example, and start to identify them from these, from these scans. And again, we're getting this all at once in the same, same acquisition. So I'm just going to take a, a, a quick aside here. Um, as I've mentioned, there's essentially an infinite number of possibilities in terms of what this acquisition should look like. And the number of unknowns, I gave a physics colloquium actually last Thursday where I went over this part. Um, you could easily have in a five minute scan something on the order of 150 trillion options, um, 150 trillion unknowns in terms of what sequence could, could run. And obviously solving that kind of um, optimization problem for the best sequence is a little bit challenging. Um, it's, it's, it's wildly out of, out of reach for us. Um, so as Andy mentioned, we have this collaboration with Microsoft on HoloLens, which is being that guy's wearing there. Uh, but through those connections, we also have a collaboration now on quantum computing. You may have seen this. Um, and so we're using um, quantum computing or quantum computing concepts, um, which could potentially solve these 100 trillion unknown problems um, to try to figure out what the optimal MR acquisition is. Um, I particularly wanted to show this here for the faculty, um, and I'm going to take a, a, a real diversion for a second. Um, I love it here, and I uh, cannot, I, I'm continually surprised week by week at the amazing work that's being done here by the faculty and by the students and everybody else who's, who's on this campus. Um, and I'm, I've gotten around enough, and I'm tired enough of people asking me why I'm not in Silicon Valley. Um, and so I've kind of made it a small little mission of mine um, <laughs> to tell the stories that we're doing here um, so that I can, can be, you know, go out and everybody in the world knows, yeah, Case Western, that's the place where, where I want to be too. Um, so this little, this little adventure has led to, to a little story. Um, so this is, um, you may know him, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. For a while, two weeks ago, he was the CEO of the largest company in the world. Um, He's still pretty big. Um, this, was, this was a conference in October. He's freaking, speaking in front of about 20,000 people, and I didn't know about this until after. Um, but uh, I knew a little bit. I knew it was going to happen, but, but I didn't know what he was going to say or anything. So I, I thought I would just play this for you guys. Now, the last example I want to use and I want to talk about is Case Western Reserve. And Case Western Reserve has always led with innovation. Last year, we talked about quantum computing, and one of the things that we did is to prepare people, because the entire computer science stack of a quantum computer is going to be different. None of the things that we learned with the one out the machine are going to be relevant. It's so sort of sad, but it's going to be true. And so it means you're going to relearn how to think about the core algorithms. So we put a simulator up on Azure. And there was a researcher at Case Western who had done some fundamental work on how to take MRI machines and using this technique of tissue fingerprinting, get much better at accurately detecting cancer right in the early stages of scanning. But one of the challenges of computing. So I, I already said it, and I, I'll, I'll just save the time. Um, I just want to restate that line because it's not. It's not because of me, but he said, Case Western Reserve has always led with innovation. 
I like that line. I think we should all use that everywhere. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to go back to, to fingerprinting in this point. If, if anybody wants to talk about quantum computing, I'd love to. Um, so I want to go back to the, to the stuff that I was talking about at the beginning. Um, that if we do get these numbers, we want to make sure that they mean something. So I'm going to fly through this little section here, um, but we've spent an inordinate amount of effort in the last three years in particular trying to prove that. Um, so we've been working very closely with NIST, the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, in particular out of um, Boulder, Colorado. So Katie Keenan, who's been here and gave a talk uh, earlier in the year, um, has been one of the leaders on that. And just to fly through this, um, the answer is yes, this stuff is stable. So um, Yun Zhang from our group um, scanned the same NIST phantom every day for 34 days. Um, and the variation in T1 for the values that we care about was around 1%. Um, and for T2, again, for all the values that we care about was about 3%. Um, just to put this in perspective, um, Katie and, and, and our group got, got connected because she's in charge of trying to prove this out for the conventional types of acquisitions on a global scale. So she had completed this very difficult study um, where they took that same phantom and put it out at different sites. And they did an hour and a half long acquisition for T1 and um, about a 40 minute acquisition for T2. And what they showed was that the T2 was so variable, they're not even going to publish the results because they were random. They were essentially useless. And then in this hour and a half long acquisition with the conventional scan on the left there, you can see that the variation, that those first white lines are 40%, right? So even for the values that they care, you know, that we care about, which are over here on the right, the, the variability is on the order of 10 or 15%. Just to refresh, the fingerprinting ones are on the order of 1%. If you go to these faster eight-minute acquisitions that are typical um, for people that are trying to quantify this stuff um, these days, it's, it's a very fast thing. Again, those are essentially random numbers in my mind. Um, so with fingerprinting, we're in the 1%. Um, we've worked with Siemens to do this. It's, this was early data on five scanners. Again, um, this is a study that we did between here and Brazil, two scanners where we did test-retest. Uh, this is a prostate exam. It's on the order of 1% in T1. It's for the ones that we care about are on the order of 5% or less for T2. Um, this is in the liver. Same deal, um, just a few percent. Um, and I wanted to compare this to the, the closest thing that we have to a clinical standard quantitative imaging in MR, which is for cardiac MR. Um, there's a massive working group and these are just the papers. I was part of this group of about 50 people that were consulted on this. And, and this, is the, this is the core group that actually did the work. But there, there was a whole bunch of people that were, were consulted on this. Um, trying to come up with clinical standards for quantitative imaging, because they're actually using this out in the field. And I just want to point out, um, so they're doing native T1 and T2 mapping. And it's this bottom thing. That's the, or the second thing that, that, that is the, the most important in, in the third. Reference ranges should be generated from data sets that were acquired, processed, and analyzed in the same way as the intended application, basically on your site. So you can make a reference for your magnet. And then if you, if you can't do that, you, can't, you should not report them. So this is like everybody's got their own thermometer out in the world. So you can make a thermometer for, for your magnet, but, but I can't compare your thermometer to somebody else's magnet. This is clinically standard. That's 2017, right? And people are billing for this. So this is crazy in my mind. So I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, and by having this be repeatable, I think that we're going to start to learn new things. Um, so we, the first thing that we did do is, is start to just examine normal people. Um, so Chaitra Bodway from our group did this. Um, and so it's 50, 56 volunteers. And what you could, we did, we did some test retest on, on these people as well. And you can start to look at these results and first off see that the reproducibility is on the order of 1%, like what we saw. And, and when we brought these people back, even over a week, with no control over their, their food, their sleep, anything, you could see differences between people in just normal, white, normal appearing white matter regions. So the difference between um, subject three and subject five here is probably real. 
And so we don't really know what this means, but this is now potentially opening up a whole area of research that we could do. You know, what is, is there some physiological difference between three and five? What does it mean and what can we do with it? Um, we've seen this in aging as well. So this is, if we plot all of those patients, we can see trends. Some of them are linear, some of them are um, non-linear. You can see gender-related differences. Unfortunately, it's bad news for, for the men in this cohort that they're all trending towards, towards higher age-related effects than less. Um, but the fact that we can now see this um, really tells us that, that there's new opportunities here. Again, I'll just note that our reproducibility is on the order of one or two or three percent, but the, the, if you look at the spread, the biological spread between these people here across the whole cohort, you see that it's way bigger than that. So again, we believe that that relates somehow to biology. Now it's up to somebody to figure out what that means. Um, we're also going to higher and higher resolutions. So these are 3D scans in about two and a half minutes, and the, the, the highest res ones are these ones. Um, about 1.2 millimeter isotropic um, done by Dan Ma from our group, you saw in that video too. Um, and she just got a recently a pretty large R01 uh, in collaboration with Cleveland Clinic to, to apply this technology to epilepsy in particular. Um, and so this is one of the areas that, that I think we're all pretty passionate about. Um, if you look at this, this clinical scan of this um, patient with the heterotopias here, um, you can't really see much of any difference between these different regions. So you, you could ask the question in this patient with you know, epileptic attacks, where, where is the lesion that, that um, we care about here? You can't really see it clinically at all. If you do a conventional BBM kind of analysis, you also don't see any difference. Uh, but if you start looking at the T1 maps, you can see that one of them really does stand out compared to the other ones. And that one actually correlated to the epileptic um, focus for this patient. Um, so uh, this patient's um, been treated, and I believe this one went on to, to a good result. I need to check on that with Dan, though. Um, another area where we're getting kind of um, black and white answers is in prostate cancer, um, where we're seeing differences between prostate cancer, so PCA down there in the normal peripheral zone. Um, and you can get graphs like this, which I think are pretty easy for anybody to interpret. The high-grade cancers are the dark circles. The low-grade cancers are the filled in or the, the clear circles, and the pluses are normal tissue. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to make a diagnostic test. There, we can um, put the patient in the magnet, get the result, and know for sure uh, without a biopsy what's going on. Um, other groups are taking this on as well. So groups out at Stanford, um, Tom Christensen, for example, um, has taking a different approach and in, in, in using this fingerprinting concept have come up with a way to measure simultaneously, again, cerebral blood volume, the um, average vessel radius, and then the blood O2 sat for that region. And they're particularly applying this to stroke uh, and tumors and have shown some really nice results in the, in the just recent past. All right, so I'm gonna fly through just this, actually, I'm gonna skip this. Um, I will do this though. So, uh, yeah, I'll skip that. Um, one of the things that this allows you to do when you, when you start thinking differently is to start um, thinking about uh, mixtures of tissue also differently. So if we look inside the brain inside a single pixel, we know that different tissues are going to be in each pixel. Um, but when we do a conventional MRI exam, they're both going to vary, for example, with a T2 decay. And when we mix them together, it, it's a bi-exponential decay, but it's very difficult to tell that unless you, you make some assumptions. It looks like a mono-exponential decay. When we go to fingerprinting, though, we know that these signal evolutions could look wildly different for the two different tissue types. And so when you put a mixture of those two together, they do not look like either one individually. And so we can make some simple models and um, this is just one of them that we can start with a simple assumption that we know something about the, these basis tissues. So if we know something about the gray matter, white matter, and CSF, we can then ask a question, how do we, how much of each of these is present in each voxel? This has an analytic solution that you can write down and solve very easily. And you can get maps like this that are now quantitative across scanner and across days where you're looking at the CSF volume fraction, the gray matter volume fraction, and the white matter volume fraction. 
Um, and again, this is independent of the, the, the system that you're using. So going back to the um, to, to an epilepsy case, uh, this is a case where um, the radiology read here was hyperintensity in, in the amygdala, um, which came from this flare. Again, not terribly quantitative. Um, but when you looked at the pathology that came back, it was very different than that. And so you had to go back and look at this region. If you look at that clinical scan, you will see nothing abnormal there. And it doesn't matter how we window it, you will not see any abnormality there. Um, but on this fingerprinting scan, you can see this, this tail of, of tissue here that um, is, has abnormal T1. Uh, when you look at the gray matter fraction, that's a, that's a chunk of gray matter that's sitting in a place where there should only be white matter. And that corresponded to the clinical um, pathology read that came back. It was actually bridging to, to cortical regions, which is kind of a classical um, epilepsy appearance. Um, you did not get that from the conventional analysis. Um, Steve Jones down the way has also recognized that when we start looking at these gray matter fraction maps, they look different for different areas of the brain. So if you look really closely in that upper left image, you can start to see that there's less gray matter in primary motor cortex. And if you look at visual cortex back here, you can see that there's, there's less that's there. And this was just a visual note that he made. Um, but over the last year, Dan and Irene Wong from the, from the clinic have now started to, to put the, these fingerprinting data into m &I space. And then you can start pulling out analysis of different Brodmann's areas. Um, and sure enough, across this population that they've analyzed up till now, things like motor cortex, so 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, and uh, visual like 17 are showing smaller gray matter fractions, which we probably know should happen. But now we're getting a quantitative read on this. And again, I want to, you know, you can see these. So this is the, the map on the left and the, and the clinical scan on the right in m &I type space. You can start to visually see these. So now we can start to make quantitative numbers about things like Brodmann's areas. And we're getting this all at the same time. I just want to be clear. We're doing one acquisition at the front, and we're getting all this data at the end, all quantitative and hopefully all reproducible. Um, so there's, there's hopefully a lot there. All right, my, my last little example, and then I'll um, get off, is I just want to go back to the beginning and, and ask a question about, you know, what were the requirements for this whole thing that I talked about? It's really pretty simple, right? It's that, that the readout in our acquisition is pseudo-random. It's varying all the time. The cool thing is that in our world, there's a lot of things that are random, or pseudo-random, or at least random on the time scale of NMR. And one of my favorite ones is stuff like this. So this is Yo-Yo Ma playing box suite number one. It's a beautiful piece of music, but if you think about it on the millisecond time scale, it's completely random in the sense that I can't predict what's coming from one millisecond to the next. Um, so we could use that as the basis for our acquisition. So you can start with uh, that audio file, which looks like this. You can do some simple things like uh, conventional audio compression, and then we start designing our acquisition around this audio file. Um, and Dan got a, a Trailblazer R21 on this, this basic concept. Um, and so what you get is an acquisition that looks like this now. So we start with Yo-Yo Ma, and then we're gonna transition into the magnet. So besides the fact that we're, we're getting this, this beautiful sounding acquisition that's not this bang, bang, bang that you typically associate with MRI, um, we're getting these quantitative numbers out at the same time. So quantitative T1, quantitative T2, and, and proton density. And the key thing is that because it's just random, and random is random is random, um, the efficiency is actually about the same. So if we look at the efficiency, so the precision per, per square root of unit time for T1 and T2, um, and compare it to our conventional acquisition, it's essentially the same. Um, and so why shouldn't every MR exam sound like that? Right? So we're getting quantitative numbers in an acquisition that sounds like Bach, which, which we like. Um, so just to summarize this, I, I hope I've convinced you that we, we have this pathway now where we could potentially get 
quantitative numbers that are reproducible and actually mean something. And so if we apply these correctly, um, we should end up with better health care for our patients. Um, that's at least the goal. Um, so just to be clear, I did almost none of this. Um, so we have this phenomenal lab of people across the way. Um, Dan Ma was the first author on the, the first paper in Nature, and there's Yun Zhang, and there's a whole slew of people up here who have done this work. Uh, I just want to thank and acknowledge all of them. Um, I also got some slides from Martin Close from Stanford and, um, or sorry, Martin Close from NYU and Thomas Christen from Stanford. And thank you to everybody who invited me and made this happen today. Thanks. How, how should we go? Go ahead, Dominic. Um, thanks. Very nice talk. One question. The, it, you started with this idea that using the MRI, you can make a diagnosis to remove biopsy, to eliminate biopsies, the need for. But my understanding from the clinician is that they do see an abnormality from the MRI scan, and they still go in there to get a biopsy to make sure that whatever you see is malignant or not. So is there... It, what you're showing, is this a probability that the, the area is malignant, or can it really be eventually a, a test that eliminates completely biopsy, and the clinician will be sure, yes, that's definitely malignant, i got to remove it, I don't need a biopsy. Yeah, so I, I, this wasn't the oncology audience, so I didn't show a lot of that. But this, this example is the one that I think is going to be the first to do that. Um, so across the street at university hospitals, I don't think there's a single man that comes in um, to the urology clinic that doesn't get an MR with, with suspected um, prostate lesion. Um, and we are getting to the point now where we're establishing these as gold standards. Again, if you remember back, we, we're doing, we have this here and in Brazil on multiple different scanners, and the reproducibility is on the order of 1% for T1, 3% for T2. Um, and ADC has been established to be on the order of 1% as well. This is a diffusion coefficient. Um, and I'm only showing two dimensions of the three-dimensional data here. But so let's imagine that, again, my reproducibility is from 100 to 102 or 3 in T2. So if I get a number and I know that, and, and that number comes in with a T2 of 60, I, I don't even need to go further. And our clinicians across the street are adopting this, that that's a high-grade cancer that just needs to get treated. So on the other hand, I get a value of 200 for the T2. I know that I'm completely in the clear. I don't have to biopsy that as, at all. And so this is precisely what we're trying to do here. We think that achieving a reduction in biopsies by half is easy here. Um, and, and we think that, that not only is this going to be better for the patients, more cost effective, even when you include the MR scan here. So this is being offered, um, we're doing like 15 minute screens now. Um, so the idea is to establish this to be something on the order of like a colonoscopy or a mammogram for breast cancer, that you come in every X, X years, get a scan, and if you have any tissue in your prostate that's below that line that we could all draw with our eyes that's in that lower left-hand corner, you biopsy it or you treat it directly, um, everything in the upper right, you just are in the clear. Tom has him up. I'm struck with the uh, idea about that I saw here was the 10 years worth of work. Uh, something happened. Yeah. And then in two weeks, we were on a new path. I'd like to understand better, or just hear again, well, both of them. Yeah. What happened in those moments before the two weeks? Yeah. Thanks what, for what, what happened there? Thanks. Thanks for asking that, Tom. I've probably given this talk like a hundred times, and I give it for that. Like the whole crux is that that series of days. So, so I appreciate the question a lot. Nobody ever asked that. Um, I think it does come back to this this running up against a wall that you just didn't think that you could do, but you you have this this idea in the back of your head. There's got to be a, a way to do this. You, you know, it's. We cannot be in this world where we're sticking needles in people anymore. It just can't be. And so that, that series of weeks um, was about adopting some thoughts that had actually come in from the math world. Um, so in 2004 and 5, there was this concept called compressed sensing, which was coming out. 
which is probably relevant. Everybody in the room should probably know about this. That um, this this idea that you could um, do sensing randomly, um, and for a lot of systems, um, make some simple assumptions about what's going on in there, and and, and get a, a full picture of you know a full image out from dramatically reduced number of samples. This this was an idea in the math world. Um, um, it got actually a Fields Medal um, based on these developments. And so we had these, these thoughts, um, and, and the original authors, this is a beautiful paper by um, Manuel Kendez that came out in 2005, math guy out of Stanford, um, and Terry Tao, who's at UCLA now. Um, two mathematicians, and in, their, in the discussion of their very first paper on this new mathematical theory on randomized matrix sampling, they said, hey, this might work in MR in their discussion. And I probably spent, I was talking about this yesterday, I probably spent six months just trying to understand this one stupid paper. Um, and so we had those thoughts from, from the math world kind of, kind of baking around. And at the same time, we're trying to do this other stuff. And we're trying to, to, to bash through this wall that's not there. And the, the answer came was like, well, wait a minute, why don't we try this stuff that we're working on over here and just apply it over here? Because this is, this is just not going anywhere. And it was this, literally this afternoon of, of just sitting around and thinking about what the implications of that would be. I mean, it, it, what I talked about today means giving up a lot of the stuff that you know. The, the people in our field are still a little bit freaked out about it because it involves so, walking back so much of what, we, what we've done in the past. We had 60 years of established MR, chucking it. Um, and so, but, but for us, it was that sit, sitting there in that moment and just saying, wait a minute, this, this might actually work. There, here's a knob, here's a set of knobs that we haven't turned at all. We haven't, we haven't played around in this space at all. And the only reason that we haven't played around with it is because everybody said, you shouldn't do that. So there's no physics, there's no reason why we shouldn't do that. And as soon as you go over and you turn that knob with the big red sign that says, don't turn this, sometimes it works. <laughs> And so, I mean, I think that, that's, that's kind of the summary. And, and, it's, and I'm not really, I'm really not kidding. As soon as we ask that question, you know, can we do this a different way? You immediately saw the, the, the doorway into this, to this world. Does that kind of answer it for you? Um, well, let me say, if I listen to this five or 10 more times, I might start to get it, but I loved it. <laughs> Thanks. So. It took us a while to wrap our head around it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. This, this idea, and this is why I would recommend it. There, there's actually a blog post that Terry Tao wrote on a single pixel camera. So if you, if you Google compressed sensing single pixel camera, you'll get a uh, blog post by Terry Tao, T-A-O. And he describes this concept of compressed sensing um, through this concept of a, of a single pixel camera. So first off, you have to think about what does a single pixel camera mean, right? You're trying to make an image. How do you get an image out of a single pixel? Well, he'll show you how to do that. Um, it's this very different way of thinking about the world. And if you think about uh, the, the example in fingerprinting is that we are modeling the physical world that's happening and doing a matching. It's very different than an inverse problem, which is the typical way that we make an image. Right? We're typically solving an inverse, and this is a pattern match, and it's fundamentally a different process. And I, I'm doing an MR, and I talk about those fundamentals because you could do the same thing in ultrasound. I'm positive that you could do the same thing with um, neural recordings as well. So if you're, if you're gonna make a model of some physical process that's happening, right? And you, at some stage in what you're doing, you're gonna do a fit, for example, or you're gonna do some sort of inverse process to try to understand what's happening there. I am positive that this type of approach of going the other way around, of doing, viewing this as a random matrix problem and, and solving it with a pattern match instead of an inverse solution will give you better results. And we're showing this in some other areas as well. The Kaskulani's lab, is, has shown that modeling of contrast agent dynamics through the blood system is better using pattern matching than doing an inverse solution. And this is this weird corner on our world, but do you see this, this, this door that's opened up and it's enabled by having massive computers. You cannot have imagined doing this in the mid 90s even. Even back in 20, 
probably 2005, we didn't have the computers to do this. We have them now, and this is a, a potential opportunity to, do, to, to really fundamentally change the way we do stuff. Mike's got his. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Thank you for giving this talk. Um, I have a question a little bit more about what you were talking about, the, needing the quantum. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to solve that you currently can't solve? I, I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, I glossed over it. Um, so I could probably bring up my physics talk from last week, but let's just, well, let's go back to this one. So at every point in time in our acquisition, I can be, I can be um, outputting an RF field, and I can output it in, in any one of two, kind of two phases, let's say. Um, and then I also have um, three gradient encodings that I could do. I have a gradient in X, Y, and Z. I can... Um, do all of those every 10 microseconds. Okay, so I have five fields, and let's say I've got a five-minute acquisition. So that's that one I think is 153 billion-ish unknown, something like that. Um, so what the, the the question there, the unknown is, how much RF and how much what gradient encoding should I be doing every 10 microseconds? Right. So that's how you get to that number of unknowns. Um, in our more modern systems, we also have 32 transmit channels. So it's not just one RF pulse, it's, it's actually 30, it's 32 coils that I could be outputting. So each one of those has two potential field phases. So that's 64 there. And then we're also driving, instead of just three um, gradient axes, we have um, magnetic fields associated with each one of those coils individually. So that's another factor of 32 on there. And that's how you get up this, this 153 trillion unknowns. So the images you're showing us, the data you're showing us, it's just from a subset of all that possibility? We've made some choices based on our MR knowledge gotcha. that this structure should work there. So we, we have this inversion pulse at the front, for example, which follows a form that somebody developed in the 1950s. The gradient axis there for slice selection, again, comes in the 1980s. Yeah, to what's known. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So then, I guess. So I go back to my, my thing, right? The worst thing to do is just because somebody did it before, and we're, we're doing that here. Potentially, you could uncover a lot more dimensionality to this. Yeah. To this, I see. So, I mean, just for my simple mind, you're, you're basically. Actually, I, I will just go ahead and open up the, the talk I gave the other day. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm just thinking back, because, you know, my background's in systems. You, you're, you're sending random perturbations and doing system identification on the system. Is that essentially? Yeah. Like, yeah. But you've got multidimensional, you know, perturbations, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's wonderful. So, so then I guess my question is, does, does this potentially sort of, can it advance the, the limitation of, say, fMRI to increase the temporal resolution of MR? Um, potentially, yeah. So this is one of the things that we're trying to do here is, oh, come on, is to to take the additional degrees of freedom that we've got yeah. and and use them to our advantage. Right. Um, so it doesn't suffer sort of the typical limitation of using random perturbations where you have to wait, right, to apply those because you're using multidimensional. We've got that going yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool. And and the, the key thing that I want to point out here is that we can make the assumption that, that the output is also known. And we're just choosing between different, different potential combinations. So in, if we were to think about the, the kind of old days of computing, you could maybe store like 10, 20, whatever number of sets, right? Well, now I can store, like for our typical things, we're storing billions, up to billions of combinations of potential tissue types that we're gonna, that we're gonna potentially scan. So in the, you know, even, you know, so it, it, one of our dictionaries that we use is beyond 32 bit size. One dimension of it's beyond 32 bits, yeah. which, you know, again, 10 years ago, you could barely do. And now it's just trivial, gotcha. right? I can match that. I can do those matches in, in seconds over a whole image. And so the, the system identification thing is, is spot on. Yeah. The, the, again, the cool thing is that I can make assumptions about the range of possibilities on the end. Uh -huh. For those of you who want to get really like super mathy, the, the 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 manifold of potential solutions there is smooth and finite and known. It's not a full 
like random space that we've got here. And we can understand that manifold. We can define it up at front. Because you're dealing with physical. Because we're dealing with matter, it. Right? We know yeah. it. But, yeah. and, and, and my argument is that every time you're going to do a model at the end of your, your solution, right, you're already imposing something on it. And right now we solve that through, through inverse methods because we can't store this thing. Right? But as soon as you're doing that, as soon as you're imposing a model, um, you could potentially just start with that model and work your way back right. through pattern matching. Okay. And the, the thing that you, you so um, the, the solution with quantum computing here, I can, I can just skip past. Um, when you're doing kind of classical inverse methods, you're doing some sort of gradient descent at some level of the problem. And for many of these situations, there's a lot of oscillations at the bottom of your solution space that you may not even be aware of. Um, and so what happens is that you'll get to a solution that's not the global minimum. And unless you have a mechanism to get around that, you're, you're just going to not get the right answer. So quant the, the cool thing in quantum computing is that you can, you can write down an equation and you can essentially tunnel through these barriers. Um, and get to the global solution. That's part of the idea, even for these big, big situations. I'll just quickly summarize this too. This is some early results from that, that um, the green is where we are. And, and what we're looking at here is a graph of the average magnetization, so the signal level, versus the inner product between gray matter and white matter, which tells us how well we can separate them. Right? So ideally, we'd be in the upper right-hand corner, or sorry, the, the lower right-hand corner is where we want to be. Right, so perfectly separable, lots of magnetization. What we're seeing is that there's a frontier as we run all the different combinations from the, the quantum world. We see that there's this barrier that we can't get past. That's probably related to the physics, and we've got some, some answers that will potentially allow us to get through there at least a little bit. Um, but you can see that our conventional sequence, which is the green dot, is a long way away from what we would consider optimal. So those are the kind of gains that we're, we're already getting. That's great. No, thank you. It looks like you have a large range of uh, quantified T1 and 2 values across a range of patients. That sounds like it's going right into automated diagnostics. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I, and I think this gets back to Dominique's original question, too, that when these numbers start to mean something, um, you may not need any extra information. You could just potentially go directly from that number to a treatment. And, and computers are really good at displaying numbers. <laughs> so... Um, that, that's part of the goal here, too. Thank you very much. I heard, um, I'm a neurologist, and I heard about fingerprinting and a case for a long time, but I, this is terrific. I can't believe that I um, haven't looked into that. So as a practical question, so I um, put patients in a scanner for one hour probably every day. Yeah. So what would it take now to get this into a clinical realm where are you with that so we're working with some commercial partners to try to get it out into those worlds to do the fda approval that it would require to get that out into the average person um i can't tell you exactly what's happening but but that's progressing at a very good rate um so does it take a, a different scanner completely or can, is that a software i just it's a software update so we're even making a big push to try to get this to run on very old or con what we would consider low quality scanners to improve access to healthcare in the developing world. So if you are somebody in India, you might have access to an MRR. The access to a radiologist is about a factor of 100 lower than in the US. And in, in Africa, it's, it's unheard of. And so the idea here, going back to your question, is that if I can put a number that means something, now I potentially can give billions of people access to healthcare that they don't have now. So this is one of the big pushes. So, so not only will it work on any scanner here, we're hoping to make it work on any scanner anywhere, even 12, 13-year-old scanners. I love all the conversation. Sorry. We're going to have to cut it off. I encourage you to go and, uh, and uh, chat with Mark and reach out to him about either this stuff or the interactive comments. That's where we're thinking again. Thanks. Thanks.